Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech, my name is Alan. So I just finished watching The Last Jedi uh, the other night, and uh, the film left me kind of confused. I mean, I, I knew exactly what was going on, the, the plot was pretty straightforward, but I'm not really sure how I feel about the film itself. Sure, I got rave reviews again from the critics, and I always love watching a new Star Wars film, but I couldn't help but feel a tiny bit disappointed when I left the theater, which put me in an identity crisis. If I can't enjoy Star Wars, then who the hell am I? Well, this morning I went again and saw the film so I could get a better grasp of what the hell was going on, and I still don't really quite have a good grasp on it, but I'm willing to give you guys a review of what I thought was good about the film, what I thought was kind of okay, and then what I thought was terrible about the film. And yes, there will be spoilers in this video, so just watch out. It's a Star Wars film, which means it costs about around the same as the GDP of a small country to make. The effects in production are phenomenal as usual. The few worlds we do get to see are beautifully envisioned and have terrific art direction. The porches are the most delicious looking Star Wars critters since the Ewoks and Return of the Jedi, and the battles were terrific as well. It was amazing to see those TIE fighters cut through the formation of Resistance bombers in the opening scene. Sure, it kind of makes no sense for futuristic starships to rely on bombs that rely on gravity to propel them especially in vacuum, but it definitely reminded me of a World War II bomber being swarmed by the Luftwaffe, which is exactly what Lucas would have wanted. And finally, someone used the hyperdrive as a weapon, which was just awesome. When Laura Dern Admiral Akbar is into the First Order fleet, the entire theater went up in cheers, even at 8.30 in the morning. It was the coolest moment in Star Wars since that Hammerhead Corvette rammed those two Imperial Star Destroyers together over Scarif. The battle on Crate was also visually stunning, the red mineral deposits flying in the air like red contrails added an artistic flair to an otherwise brutal confrontation. All the new faces are really starting to grow into their characters. But what really stands out is Mark Hamill's portrayal as Luke Skywalker. All those years of voice acting really paid off. He's 20 times the actor he was in the original trilogy. Luke's final showdown with Kylo Ren was a great surprise and a relief. I don't know if I could have handled another one of my favorite characters getting skewered by Kylo Ren. Carrie Fisher also has improved quite a bit as an actor, but unfortunately never really is given any scenes where she can let her talent shine. Which is really kind of a shame because episode 9 was really her time to shine. Kylo Ren's character is finally becoming more interesting now that we actually know what happened that one night the Jedi Temple burned down, and Adam Driver's portrayal of the emo Darksider is the only performance that eclipses Mark Hamill's. The humor for the most part worked and wasn't all that distracting. Some of the best moments came surprisingly from General Hux. If there were any doubts to who was in second command of the First Order, Ryan Johnson's liberal use of humor has erased them. It was a nice direction that definitely made the Nazi Raggedy Ann doll much more likable. And finally, the First Order calls the Resistance what it really is, Rebel Scum. This is a long movie by Star Wars standards. It's two hours and 30 minutes, yet it kind of feels like not a lot of important things happen throughout the film. The main storyline is basically Mad Max in space. It's just one giant chase. All the First Order has to do is follow the Resistance until their fuel runs out. There's no real sense of urgency, and that's reflected by the lazy plasma bolts that bounce off the back shields of the Mon Calamari cruiser. The subplots are designed to create more tension, but they just aren't that great. Rose and Finn have some adorable moments together, but their chemistry panels in comparison to Finn and Poe's bromance in Force Awakens. Their journey to Canto Bright is a bit unfocused and random. I mean, are they there to find a thief, or are they there to free a bunch of alpacas from arms dealers? I don't know. And then when they get introduced to DJ, who easily is one of the most interesting new characters, nothing really happens. DJ is hardly developed as a character before he turns over Finn and Rose to the First Order, and he then just sort of disappears. The same could be said about Admiral Hodo and Poe Dameron's subplot. It's the classic hot-headed pilot who rebels against his commander scenario but it's just not executed very well. The message isn't clear because they're both sort of right. Poe Dameron gets reprimanded for disobeying orders, yet he succeeds in taking out one of the largest ships in the First Order and buys enough time for the Resistance to escape. So is he actually doing anything wrong? And then there's Admiral Hoda, who at first seems kind of like the bad guy, or girl. But that's not really true because she ends up kind of being a hero and she actually has a pretty good escape plan. But for some odd reason, she won't tell Poe, which is why he carries out a mutiny and sends Ro and Finn on their secret mission in the first place. Everything that happens seems unnecessary and avoidable. It's almost as if the writer is trying to introduce some artificial tension to make the main plot, which again is just a slow chase scene, a little more interesting. I had the same feeling during Rey and Luke's subplot as well. 
It follows the stereotypical student waits outside the master's hut until he finally agrees to teach them scenario. Luke just seems way too distraught over his failure of Kylo Ren. It's been years since it's all happened, so you'd think he would have recovered by now. I mean, this is a guy who got his hand cut off by a dude he didn't know was his father because another dude who happened to be his Jedi Master lied to him about it. And then that same Jedi Master who kind of is like his father lied to him about a certain princess, which consequently led him to hooking up with the sister several times. Despite all of this, he still refuses to let go of the Jedi Code, even as his father offers him a spot by his side so that they could take over the galaxy together. Which is probably what every kid who grew up without a father dreams of. I mean, it's almost as if the writers started composing this part of the story backwards, focusing on their end result first, which is to get Luke out of the picture, and then creating a half-assed story to justify it. And that's kind of the real problem. The Force Awakens left us with many questions. And The Last Jedi's answers to those questions were just, eh, why is Luke in exile? Well, the answer is just disappointing. Who is Snoke? Well, why do we care anymore now that he's half the man, or should I say half the moon he was before? Just like DJ, they didn't really develop Snoke as a character. The same thing goes with Rey's parents. Instead of letting us know who they are, or at least giving us some hints, they just leave us in this weird limbo by explaining to us Rey is nobody. They even take a pivotal scene when Rey goes into the Force Cave to reinforce the point that she's nobody. That is just the most meaningless conclusion to anything. This half answer to the question of who Rey's parents is is worse than not saying anything at all because it just leaves us uninvested in who Rey's parents are. We just don't care anymore. And it's a feeling I get throughout the film. Nothing seems to be all that important or consequential. I mean, Poe Dameron single-handedly destroys all the weapons and placements on the First Order Dreadnought in the opening scene. If one X-Wing can do that to a ship that is four times larger than this Imperial Star Destroyer, which basically destroys the entire Rebel fleet over Scarif, then are the Resistance actually in any real danger? Does any of this matter? The First Order just seems so incompetent in everything they did. Captain Phasma once again is useless. Snoke is dispatched so quickly. Even as the Resistance's numbers drop to a few dozen, there's no urgency. The plot armor around this group of freedom fighters has never been more visible, and that's a terrible thing. What's missing from this film is a sense of tension created by the character's vulnerability that Rogue One did so well. And lastly, Luke telling us that he's not the last Jedi in a film called The Last Jedi is just the biggest cop out. While the film featured hundreds of sets and epic locations, it kind of felt small at the same time. I kind of wanted to know what was going on in the wider galaxy. I wanted to see the effect the First Order was having over the rest of the galaxy. I wanted to see stormtroopers marching through occupied cities. If you're going to have so many subplots, why not make that one of them? It would put much more weight on the rest of the film. It would make the survival of the Resistance seem that much more important if we could see just how badly the First Order was treating the rest of the galaxy. Another missed opportunity is Canto Bight, which was an extremely cool setting, yet it was easily the most boring part of the film. When Finn and Rose escape on those giant alpacas, I looked over to American Ben and asked him, am I watching a freaking Harry Potter movie? And the second time around while watching this scene, I actually fell asleep, which never happened to me ever in a Star Wars film. And perhaps the ugliest thing of all is I now realize why I didn't enjoy The Last Jedi as much as I did The Force Awakens. It's because Han Solo wasn't in it. And that's the fundamental issue with this new trilogy. It doesn't stand on its own just yet. It's being pulled in two different directions. On one side, you have diehard fans who aren't willing to let go of the old characters. And on the other side, you have Disney and Lucasfilms who are trying to reinvent Star Wars so it doesn't die. So just as we're falling in love with Luke, Han, and Leia all over again, they put them into secondary roles or just take them away. And at the same time, we're just beginning to appreciate all the new characters like Rey, Finn, Poe, and Kylo, but we just need a bit more time to actually know them so we actually can enjoy them as the main characters of a Star Wars film. So what we have is a film that is really more a transition and an evolution than it is about telling a good story. But that leaves me excited for the next film. Maybe we can finally leave behind the old characters that we love. As sad as I am to see my favorite smuggler and ancestral twins let go, maybe it's a good thing. Now we can finally see Kylo, Rey, Finn, and Poe have their own story, which isn't held back by this awkward transition we're still seeing. And a lot of old fans are gonna hate this movie just as much as they did The Force Awakens, and to them I say this. I completely understand where you're coming from. 
Han Solo was Star Wars for me. But the thing is, we have to let go of our hold on Star Wars. Let it evolve so that one day our children can have their own new generation of Star Wars. Well guys, that's my review, and it does come from the heart. Um, I try to be as honest as possible. Obviously, I have some very mixed feelings about this new film, uh, and it's hard for older fans like me, and I know a lot of you guys out there, this is a transitional period for Star Wars, and no one likes to see their favorite characters get taken away from them. No one wants change to a formula that's worked so well, but, you know, if you don't have change, things die and they have to cater to newer audiences now. And I'm not that old of a guy, but even me compared to the teenagers nowadays, like our, our tastes are completely different. And the way I think compared to the older viewers that we have out there, I, I know we think differently as well. So, you know, for Star Wars to survive, it really does need to evolve. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because Star Wars to me has always been about the galaxy, the universe, not really just about the Skywalker family. I mean, I loved Kotar, I loved the expanded universe, all the novels, comics, I mean, that's what really, you know, kept me going in between the films, and as long as the Star Wars universe is there for me to visit, I think I'll be a Star Wars fan forever. Well guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our Last Jedi coverage, and, uh, you know, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.